I'm a father, and I want to speak to fathers about fathers. Now, if you're not a father, um, God willing, you'll um, pick up things about fatherhood and the fatherhood of God by overhearing what I'm going to talk to dads here about. So my topic specifically is, what, what is a father supposed to do? I'm feeling that there's a certain amount of confusion in our society over that question. In his book, Becoming a King, Morgan Snyder writes about meeting a decorated U.S. Special Forces warrior who is a master on the battlefield, but who struggled at home. The soldier said, I can handle a, any firefight and a 300-man ambush, no problem. My role and objectives in war are clear. It's my life at home I can't handle. My marriage, my kids, my mortgage. I'm failing. I, I feel like I live in Afghanistan and I'm deployed to my home in Texas. Morgan Snyder comments, nothing exposes more of the unfinished places in us, like us men, than our marriage and our parenting. They're the most difficult relationships in which to love well because they are the only place in which it is least possible to hide. I think Morgan Snyder was on to what a lot of fathers feel. And most of the difficulty he speaks of, I think, comes from simply not knowing what to do. But we've got a teacher, we've got a trainer, a discipler, Jesus. Notice that whenever Jesus prayed, he called God what? Father. We might say, well, of course he did. He was God's son. What else would he call him? But not only did he call God Father, he taught us to call God Father. In Matthew 6, he said, when you pray, say this, our Father in heaven. Now there's going to be, he indicates that there's going to be stuff in that prayer revealing fatherhood. However, there's a lot of people who have a hard time thinking of God as a father, much less calling him Father. For them, the word Father conjures up images of rejection anger, absence, even abuse. But the truth Jesus reveals about the Father, I mean the heavenly one, and, and, and that and also having an actual relationship with this Father Jesus reveals can heal us and set us free. Which is why I want to look more this morning at the prayer that Jesus gave us in Matthew 6. In it, we've got a model described there of fatherhood. In this prayer, we're told what a father's to do. And also, what's reasonable for a child to expect from his or her father. And from Jesus, we learn not to evaluate all fatherhood by various earthly fathers, but rather to get it and grasp it and to learn it from our heavenly father. Indeed, the heavenly father shows us how to be an earthly father. My plan, then, in this message is to draw teaching out from what Jesus gives us in the Lord's Prayer about fatherhood and to organize it. I'm going to organize it around four words, priority, provision, pardon, and protection. Here we go. First, priority. Gentlemen, as a, a father, what should your priority be? Well, Jesus lays it out clarity, clearly. Your priority is God. In verse 9, Jesus starts his prayer with these familiar words. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Okay, so I, I'm not saying that you should expect your children to keep your name hallowed. But instead, this verse reflects the most basic priority a guy has got to have, a father has to have. Which is for the name of God to be hallowed in your life. In your life. When we say hallowed be your name, we're asking God that God be set apart as holy in our lives. But we don't treat God as common, as throwaway. We don't try to whittle him down to size. His very name we hallow. We acknowledge that there's no one else like him. He's above all other things. And you can see that and see that we believe that by how we conduct ourselves. Our Father in heaven is glorious. He is infinite, righteous, pure, and just. Years ago, I um, started off as a youth group leader, and then I was a youth pastor. And I used to ask the kids in my group, what's the most important thing to your parents? Uh, I was always a bit surprised by what they answered. 
Most of them said, can you guess, grades. Hmm. Grades are most important. Some said money or work or how I do in sports. Few of them said God was the most important thing in their parents' lives. And most of these kids are from Christian homes. When God's name is hallowed in my life, everyone, especially my family, knows that he's the most important thing to me. And Jesus goes on. The next thing he puts in his prayer is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now what's that? God's kingdom, God's kingdom is when God rules, when God reigns. Where the, where the king, where what the king wants done is done. Dad's the, the prayer for the father's rule is a prayer for it to be in your heart and in all with God in your heart that you influence and guide. God's reign, the father's rule happens through you, you who are his baptized son. You, you can see then why hallowing his name must be a priority. Because you're never really going to do the will of a king that you do not honor and love. You can try pretending to honor God, but you'll never fool your family for very long about this. They'll pick up what's important to you by what you say and by the choices you make with time and with money, by what you talk about and by seeing uh, what gets you most excited. The Father is hallowed in our lives when doing His will takes precedence over doing our will. Fathers, <laughs> if you're not picking this up, the, the fatherhood of God is calling each one of us to something very high and very good. It's, calling, it's not at all like the broad, easy way of the world. That is not the call in our lives. And the Father above will teach you and me. And he'll coach you and me like a great father. He will coach you and not crush you to live as one of his. For example, in Romans 12, 17, God's word says, never pay back evil to anyone. Now, basically, that means don't, don't take payback. Don't take vengeance into your own hands. Don't do that. Let God take care of it. But how few of us men really do that? And I tell you, I am guilty of this. My first inclination when I am hurt or wronged is not to listen to my Father in heaven. It's not to trust and obey him, but my first inclination is to drop the gloves and make things right in my anger. This is not honoring to my heavenly Father. It's actually unhallowing his name. In that light, I was uh, impressed by a thing Mark Mitchell wrote. Never mind who Mark Mitchell is, but anyway, he wrote a, about a friend of his who was ripped off by a former employer. To make matters worse, the former employer was a Christian. Everybody told Mark's friend to just sue the guy's pants off, but his friend refused to do so. Why? Because Scripture indicated it would be wrong to sue a brother in Christ. There is a verse like that in the Bible. He said, what, what would that do for the name of God in our community if Christians start suing each other? Here's what he did instead. He wrote the former employer a letter explaining the toll the whole mess was taking on his family. Then he graciously asked the former employer to pay him what he owed him. It was a great demonstration that he was more interested in God's will being done than in his own will. And because of that, Oh yeah, God's name was ultimately hallowed in that situation. Before long, a check did arrive in the mail, and you can be sure that keeping God's name hallowed spoke just volumes to the man's family. Hallowing God's name as our priority. That's the first point. But there's more that the Lord's Prayer shows us about being a father. A second thing is this. Jesus says that when we pray, we should say, give us this day our daily bread. Now here we learn that it's right for us to expect our Heavenly Father to provide for us. Of course it is. That's his, that's his role. He's telling you, it's my role. <laughs> he's, a, he's a father. Your father. Later in Matthew chapter 6, the same chapter, Jesus says, Don't worry 
about what you will eat or drink or wear. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't gather food into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You're worth so much more than they are. This kind of provision is also what an earthly father is called to do for his family. In fact, earthly fathers are our primary means by which the heavenly father provides for families. The food does not just appear in the refrigerator. It's there because fathers go to work and bring home the bacon. I'm not saying a mom shouldn't go to work, but my topic and focus here is fathers. A, a father is a provider. Be the guy who works and gives to his family. Do you want to encourage your dad on Father's Day? Something you might say to him is, thanks for working so hard, Dad. And thanks for providing for our family. However, <laughs> do not let your dad hear or sense complaining. You know, well, if you made more money, we could buy X, Y, and Z. There's a serious attitude problem. And any kids going around or anybody in the family going around with that attitude. In his prayer, Jesus teaches us to ask for our daily bread, not for our daily prime rib. Right? So check your heart. As a child of your father, your job, according to the commandment, is to honor him and give him thanks for daily bread. But dads, the, the daily bread thing is also a word to us. Because there's a tendency among us men to measure our worth and our identity by how much we can lavish on our families. Clothes, cars, houses. A lot of men think that this gives them a mandate to, to bury themselves in work, to make this, that happen. Other responsibilities get neglected. So listen, clothes, cars, houses, etc. Even in abundance. They aren't bad. They're not bad, but they certainly are not a measure of your value, and you know how that creeps in. Don't let it. Do not make idols of these things. A third crucial thing to know about fathering, a father pardons his children. Jesus says, forgive us our debts, that is, our trespasses, our sins, as we also have forgiven our debtors. As an expression of his steadfast love and of his mercy. Our Heavenly Father is a forgiving Father. He is. Look at that Psalm 103 again when you get a chance. He's a forgiving Father. A Father can provide all the bread in the world for his children, but God understands that if he doesn't also provide pardon, his children will be emotionally and spiritually stunted. Now, of course, this doesn't come without great cost. I, I mean to God, not to us. It comes with great cost to God. The Father gave His only Son to secure your pardon and mine. That is a staggering cost, but it was God's desire to completely redeem you, so He paid it. I've really enjoyed being a father. I'm anticipating enjoying Father's Day later today. It's brought a lot of joy, a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. But it's also quite costly. And the biggest cost is not financial, it's emotional. Fathers have got to make an emotional investment in their kids. kids. Kids need affirmation. They need encouragement. They need expressions of love. And they need them not only when they've been great. Anybody can do that when kids are star performers. But they need it especially when they've messed up. Ruining things. When they need to be forgiven. Love's got to be there then too. As fathers, we've got hopes and dreams for our kids. But you know what? Our kids are sinners just like you and me. Sometimes their sin can keep them from realizing those dreams. You know, what do you, what do, you do when that happens? What do you do when your kid goofs off in high school and his grades are too low to attend college right after graduation? What do you do when he gets his girlfriend pregnant? What do you do? when he gives up on a sport in which he could excel. Now, you could say you forgive them. That would be good. 
But will the reality be that you somehow behind your back hold on to the offense? Will you now withhold some of your favor to some degree? You know, God does not do that with you. He doesn't. This is what the Father's like. For Christ's sake, every claim and every accusation against you is canceled, ripped up, disarmed, gone. For Christ's sake, what you have from the Father in heaven is this unrestrained favor, unrestrained love, the fullness of the Spirit, nothing held back. Fathers who have not internalized the fact that they've received complete forgiveness from God and that they continue to need forgiveness find that they are unable to extend forgiveness. Bill White, who's a pastor in California, was having one of those evenings when everything goes wrong. The kids were cranky while he was making dinner, so to tide them over, he gave them some hot chocolate. His six-year-old son, Timothy, decided to throw his marshmallows at his little sister, knocking her hot chocolate all over her. She began crying, loudly crying. Just then the phone rang and the doorbell rang. He decided to answer, probably shouldn't have, but he decided to answer both, even with all the crying going on. Stress was rising. Returning to the kitchen, Bill hollered at Timothy, and then he had two crying kids. Exasperated, he put his daughter in a bath, there's no water, he put her in the bathtub, <laughs> okay, and loudly announced that he was so angry, he needed a timeout. He slammed his bedroom door shut and tried his best to cool off. He writes, everything changed about 10 minutes later when I caught sight of a yellow piece of construction paper sliding under the door. In the unsteady hand of a first grader was scrawled a message that pierced my heart and turned me around. From Timothy to dad, I still love you even when you're angry. Fathers, do you know that God still loves you even when you're angry? Or are you beating yourself up so bad you can't face it? God still loves you when you're angry and when you're bitter and when you're... He still loves you. Do you know how much you need forgiveness from God and from your own kids? If you do then let that forgiveness overflow from you into your family. Create a culture of pardon in your house. I don't say a culture without standards, but I say a culture of pardon to go along with all that. Finally, a father protects his children. In our passage, Jesus says we must come to our Heavenly Father and pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver us from evil. When we pray this, now what exactly do we mean? I mean, after all, still being in this world, we know we're still going to experience temptation and evil too. So what this prayer is, is a plea not to be tempted beyond our capacity to resist. We're saying, God, I'm weak. You know, that's just been seen so many times, let's not even deny it. God, I'm weak. Please keep me away. Lead me away from the temptation that will overpower me and cause me to fall into the pit. Please don't leave me alone with temptation that's going to overwhelm me. And I'll tell you what, that's a prayer God will answer. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13 he promises that, quote, no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God's faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, what you're able, but with the temptation, he'll provide the way to escape also that you'll be able to endure it. Now, <clears throat> we're getting that from our Father in heaven for us, and now I'm saying, and pass this kind of thing now on to your kids. The protection they need is much more than just physical protection. Your children need you to be aware of the dangers and the evils that are out there, of the world in which they live. And they will not always see it the way you see it. Your daughter might not see the danger in dating a guy five years older than her. 
but you do. Your 10-year-old son might not see the danger of playing contact football under the guidance of coaches who think somehow they're in the NFL, but you do. Your teenager might see, not see the danger of listening to music that is degrading and violent, but you do. And they'll probably insist that having unrestricted access to the internet on their phone is not a risk to them. But you know darn well that's not true. As fathers, we need to be unwilling to be unpopular at times in our homes. It's okay. It's okay to be unpopular at times. Because you're not their buddy, you're their father. We need to be willing to say, no, I'm not allowing you to do that. I am going to protect you. Now, of course, there are some fathers who take their role as protector to the extreme. They see this responsibility as an excuse, excuse to, to control, being super controlling, dominating. There was an article in the Wall Street. I can't, this is a few years ago. I forget exactly when, but it's unforgettable. To me, it was. Um, an article that contained an expression. I haven't forgotten. It said this. People want to be lightly governed by strong governments. Hmm. Well, I sometimes think that's the trick to being a dad. We need to be strong, but we need to govern lightly with gentleness and tenderness. We need to be like the policeman on the corner, tough enough to handle any neighborhood bully, but gentle enough to hoist a child to our shoulders and help them find their way home. We need fathers with a lot of muscle and a lot of restraint. And that's pretty much how God governs too. So, you want to know how you can actually become a champion father like all oh, this? is a pretty high standard here. You want to know you can actually get there? Well, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure it's really by studying and memorizing all the points in this sermon, you know? Priority, provision, pardon, and protection. Let me write that down. I'm not sure it's really going to happen <coughs> by more study, more basic, and more powerful. Learning to father happens by letting yourself be fathered by, uh, by God by the God that Jesus reveals and teaches us to pray to from our hearts. He is your true father. Do you believe that? You've got a true father, and it's the father above who created you, who redeemed you, and sustains you. The heavenly father is your true father. He knows you, and he loves you. And you get to know him, and you get to tell him that you love him. As you do, it'll be like father, like son. And you, in turn, will be empowered to be a great dad to your kids, even your adult kids. Parenting is different when your kids get older. We're still, we're still parents. A lot of this still applies. So, celebrate Father's Day. Tell your dad you love him. And tell your father in heaven, too. Amen. Now may the peace of God which transcends all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen.